Fellas, I'm talking to you. Tell me, your wife may love your home and that your is the collective yours between the both of you, but uh, does she love your smart home? Ooh. That one hit somewhere. Now I've talked to several guys who are into smart homes or even mildly into smart homes. And by no means is this a scientific experiment, but so far 100% of them have wives that are completely unenthused about the idea of smart homes and just using tech within the homes. So the question becomes now, how do you get those within your home, whoever it may be, to love your automations, to want it, to seek after it, to can't live without it? We are going to discover once and for all how we can get people within our homes to love your smart home. Okay, so here's my hunch. I believe that the key thing that is required for someone to love your automation, the very key, if we're gonna distill it down to one single thing, is that the automation must be useful. I think at the very core of it, that's all it needs to be. It just needs to be useful. Let's define a little bit more what I mean when I say an automation should be useful. At the time of recording, I think there are three things that an automation can target. They can target actual problems, they can target complexity, and they can target, what's the last one here? Ah, cognitive load. Those three things, problems, complexity, and cognitive load. But what do I mean by that? Let's take problems, right? Automations should solve problems and problems mean actual problems. Let's say you have, you live in an area where porch piracy is prevalent. You may want to have automations that help alert you quickly or help prevent that entirely. So that's something automations would be extremely useful. And it's, it'll be something that if it were to go down, you would notice immediately or you would be very incentivized to fix. And at the core of it, when you look at all of these examples, that's the main thread. If the automation were to stop, you would notice quickly and you'd be incentivized to fix it. If your automations aren't doing that, if you don't feel that pull for your automations, I would say that you'd have to question whether or not it's actually useful. Another one I have here in my list is let's say safety, enforcement of safety. This means let's say you have an automation that locks the house up or an automation that secures a premises, whatever that may be, that's something that you would notice immediately and you'd be incentivized to fix. The next uh, category, right, was complexity. It needs to reduce complexity. A more uh, notable form of this is what I've seen with, let's say, Reed Smart Home or some of the other smart home enthusiasts I've seen in the niche where they have theaters and their theater setup is rather complex, where they have several remotes for their projectors and the speakers and the TVs and whatever the case is. And they create automations and scenes that simplify it down so that way even their kids can use it with no problems. My my dad was into tech and he had like the old school tech, but we legit had a basket that had like six or seven remotes, each for something different. And as kids, we were used to it. We just went through all the different remotes, turned things on and off. My mom, on the other hand, could not stand it. Which remote turns on the TV? Which one turns on the volume? Wild, wild. Having an automation that reduces the complexity, people will notice. Your, your wife will notice. Those who aren't into the tech will notice. Now, one can say that reducing complexity also reduces cognitive load, and I, and I agree with you, but there is a subset. There is, if you draw a Venn diagram, yeah, there's an overlap, but there are sections of this cognitive load that doesn't really fall under the complexity because you can have simple things, but still require heavy cognitive load or a relatively heavy cognitive load. A good example would be things that you need to be reminded of, routines, schedules. I always forget to turn on the dishwasher. Having an automation or a mechanism that reminds us in a timely fashion, in a way that is not super static. So for instance, if I turn on a dishwasher and I remember, and I did it early in the day, and it's now nighttime, but there's no dirty dishes, I don't want to be reminded. I want my smart home to know better enough to say, hey, the dishes are already clean, I don't need to remind them, and vice versa. If there is dirty dishes, to let me know. So having something that can enforce your, your routines to remind you of things like take your pills, feed your kids, let out the dog, whatever it may be. Well, you know, that's, that's like your life is your life. And automation should help with that lowering of not just complexity, but the cognitive load, the things that you just get bogged down thinking of because we make a lot of micro decisions throughout the day. So those are the three things, problems, complexity, 
cognitive load. Why? Why is this important? Why do I think that this is going to help make your family fall in love with your smart home? Because of the smart home heuristic principle called assistant. So I have another video that talks about the smart home heuristics, but just to recap on the assistant, the assistant says that your automation should assist you. Now to complete the task, you should preferably remove one or more steps. And at worst, it should be the same number of steps as before. There are other principles, but I think that one is the most important. And here's why, no matter how cool the app is, like, oh man, it's, it's like cutting edge cool. It doesn't matter. It has to be useful and not just useful. It has to be easy to use the level of effort for me to utilize it and the impact that it gives me after I use it both needs to be high. And that's what makes apps take off. That's what make websites and anything really take off just that thing. There are other things that help support that and could ruin it, but that by far I find is the single thing that is the, that gives you the biggest bang for buck. Here's an example. I have a very simple automation for our house. This falls under the actual problems section. So this automation solves a problem for us where both my wife and I have the tendency to forget to lock our doors. Please don't rob us. To get around this, what I've done is we have a smart lock and that smart lock will essentially automatically lock after a set period of time. I want this locally controlled. So I have a local automation that will observe when we are leaving the house and if we're out of the house, ensures that the doors are locked. Simple. Remember what I mentioned at the beginning. That's the main threat. If the automation were to stop, you would notice quickly and you'd be incentivized to fix it. This is exactly what happens. Whenever the automation stops working for whatever reason, my wife notices, oh, she notices so fast. And I am incentivized to correct it because I don't want us to get robbed. In the past, my kid would escape from the house because the doors were unlocked. So I'm incentivized heavily that this remains working. But here's the subtle thing though, because my wife notices and essentially requests that this, uh, that this automation work, that is from my point of view, a metric, a very strong key metric that signifies that she likes the automation, that she wants it, that she can't live without it. You've seen my previous videos. She's not uh, easily impressed. So with that being said, I need other ways of determining whether or not I'm actually doing a good job and this is it. But here's the thing. That's just one example. I need to test my hypothesis. So along with the new year, some new opportunities came up for my wife, which will essentially shift our schedules, our routines, everything that we've been doing the previous year, a lot of it is, is, is shifting. So one of the things that my wife suggested and what she wants to try out is to use automation to keep herself on track. She wants a way to get alerted when it's time to move from the next thing to the next thing to the next. She came to me and asked if I can do it. And I did, I wanted to, but I needed to test out this hypothesis. I needed to check that my assumption was correct. Naturally, Google and, you know, Amazon and all these other folks, like their apps will make it simple for people like my wife or my kid to use the app easily. So I had her just set the automations up in there outside of Home Assistant, outside of the things that I've built. I want her to establish a baseline. That's it's going to be my control. And the whole thing is that the automations that I create must work better than the control. I'll consider that level one. Level two, I'm going to build that new automation within Home Assistant. I'm going to make it nice and robust, hopefully a little bit more, hopefully a little bit better, hopefully a little bit more dynamic, you know, put a little sauce on it. That's level two. What I need to do in level three is something new. I don't, there's no, I haven't seen anything like this anywhere, to be honest. I'm going to give her Obsidian, just a note, just on the computer. She's going to sit down and she's just going to type out what she wants. In the same way that she would tell me how she wants her automations and what she wants, she is going to just write it down in a notepad and the house will take care of it. That's what I'm shooting for. That is the peak of user experience where as a user, I don't have to know how to code. I don't have to know about any specific app. I can just simply say it out loud and it just work. But I need to go through those three levels first. Level one is already done. She already has it. Level two, 
I'm about to create. Level three, that's gonna be a separate video, but I wanted to bring this up to you guys now because to be honest, I've started this and I had a hunch about this back when I created the automation around the, the robot vacuum, like the robot vacuum butler, where my home actually controlled my robot vacuum. It did everything. All I did was tell my home, hey, when I'm home, don't vacuum. If we're asleep, you can vacuum. There were some problems, but it was able to do it. I am going to now resurrect that, fix it and iterate on it and make it more broad. So that way things like this, can happen with just simple text and it's gonna be awesome. But I'm really curious, how would you go about doing this? Do you even think that this is something that should be attempted? To be honest, like this could be like a stupid idea. It, it could be, but I'm fine trying to find out. If you were to go after this idea, how would you do it? For those of you who use Home Assistant and you're just Home Assistant diehard fans, how would you accomplish something like that? If your spouse, family member, kid, whoever it was, if someone who's not you had to create an automation for your home and you can scope it down, you can make it very simple. Let's say an automation to change the lights in some capacity, but they can't use your app. They can't use Home Assistant or go through the native app for whatever you're using. Like in our case, that's Google Home. How would you go about doing it? What would you do? How would it work? This meeting's adjourned. Wait, I'm not done. Instead of releasing a pre-recorded video of the final automation, I'm gonna do something wild. I'm gonna host a webinar. And don't worry, it's free. I talked about using Obsidian dynamically to run automations, and I even showed you how easy it was for my wife to use it. But many of you still wondered, what else? Well, I'm gonna show you how to take Markdown and leverage it in various ways within your smart home. And trust me, you've never seen automation techniques like this. But there are three things that you need to know first. One, the webinar is taking place in the Tech Enthusiast community. If you're already a community member, great, go check out the events page. But if you're not in the community, bruh, what are you doing? Click the link in the description, join the community, then do what I just told my community members to do. B, to sweeten the pot, there's a special bonus you'll get exclusively by attending. Here's the last thing you should know. There's only a hundred seats. Look, I've never done a webinar before. This is gonna be my first one. And I don't know if I'm gonna do it again. This feels really scary to put myself out there like that. And you might be saying, Mike, you're on YouTube. How scary can this be? This is different guys. This is different. I'm gonna be live. This is, I don't know. I don't know. That's a lot of pressure. I'm gonna put myself out there. I think you should too. Sign up.